Good afternoon. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here today to introduce today's program, Beyond Hollywood's Casablanca, The Holocaust and North Africa. What a great movie. Yes, there are numerous historical inaccuracies in the film, but it was remarkably on target in some key respects. Take, for example, one of my favorite scenes, Major Strasser's threat to Ilsa about her husband's fate if she doesn't turn herself in. There are only two other alternatives for him, said Major Strasser. What are they, said Ilsa. It is possible the French authorities will find a reason to put him in the concentration camp here, he said. And the other, my dear mademoiselle, perhaps you have observed that in Casablanca, human life is cheap. Good night, mademoiselle. So I mentioned this scene because you have to remember, Warner Brothers released that movie in December 1942, just six weeks after the American and British forces landed Operation Torch in North Africa. Still, the idea of concentration camps here in Morocco did not sound as odd then as it may sound today, 75 years later. The existence of those camps was known, certainly among those who were interested in knowing. So today, I think we're here celebrating with the publication of this outstanding collection by two fine scholars from UCLA, Omar Boom and Sarah Abravaya Stein. What we're celebrating is not the discovery of a new chapter in the grand story of the Holocaust, but it's rediscovery. I say rediscovery because these stories were already known by the participants, to be sure, but also by many others. Key actors wrote memoirs. Communities put their collective stories in print. Stenographers took court records. Novelists wrote great books. And as we know, wonderful films were made. Even take the emotive issue of Jewish resistance. At the very first international conference on Jewish resistance during the Holocaust, in 1968, at Yad Vashem, no less a figure than Leon Polyakov, the great historian of anti-Semitism, stood up and said the following, and I quote, the Allied forces landed in Algiers without firing a shot. Thus the role of the small, he called them the Abul Kur group, a group of Jewish anti-fascist French patriots. The role of this small group was decisive in the world war at a critical moment. Here we have perhaps the most consequential story of Jewish resistance during the entire Second World War, a resistance that changed the course of the war, a story that was discussed by the greatest historians of the Holocaust 50 years ago. And how many people here have even heard of it? Thankfully, people are beginning to hear these stories again. I'm privileged to open this program because, I suppose, I was fortunate to play a role in this rediscovery. 18 years ago, this story became my story. I came to this as someone who knew something about the Middle East, but very little about the Holocaust. I came to this as someone with an inherently political rationale for my research, especially my focus on rescuers, namely a desire to open a post 9-11 bridge to Arabs and Muslims. Just a few months after those attacks, I moved to Morocco with my wife and kids and became obsessed with learning, seeing, doing, interviewing, traveling, walking every inch of the Holocaust experience in North Africa. I traveled deep into the Algerian Moroccan desert to walk the same footsteps as thousands of Jewish, Spanish, 
and other anti-fascists imprisoned in those same Vichy concentration camps Major Strasser spoke about. I tracked down victims, rescuers, perpetrators on all sides, Jewish, Arab, Europeans. I rummaged through old government files, old archives, old newspapers, old photo albums. And the story I came away with was a profoundly human story, a story dominated by shades of gray, though with still powerful streaks of black and white. The book I wrote and the documentary I made with PBS that followed soon thereafter energized me to work with the Holocaust Museum here on ways to engage Arabs and, Muslim, and Muslims, both at the government level and the popular level, to learn their history, their own history, to come to grips with the complex reality of what happened in their countries and their societies during World War II, and most importantly, to engage with them to join with others in the collective global commitment to never again. I want to congratulate the museum for all it has done and all it continues to do, from Morocco through Tunisia, all the way to Saudi Arabia. I'm privileged to serve as vice chair of the museum's Committee on Holocaust Denial and State-Sponsored Anti-Semitism. And I don't think I'm naive to say that the walls of denial in the Middle East, if they haven't quite crumbled, they are certainly shaky and riven with cracks and fissures. We have a lot of work to do, but the, but the progress in recent years has been nothing short of revolutionary. On the academic level, I am really delighted, really delighted, and more than a bit proud that over the past decade or so, scholars far more erudite, resourceful, and insightful than I have decided to devote their graduate work, and in some cases their careers, to exploring every nook and cranny of this once known but forgotten chapter of the Holocaust, the Holocaust and North Africa. Omar and Sarah's terrific volume, reflecting the collective work of numerous scholars from around the world, is testament to the explosion of outstanding research, creative, innovative research, being done to rediscover this lost chapter of the Holocaust. And today, we get to hear directly from them about this exciting new body of knowledge. So it, with that, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Leah Wolfson, the Senior Program Officer at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies here at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, as well as Omar Boom and Sarah Abervaya Stein, to Dr. Wilson, who will serve as the moderator for today's discussion. Panelists, please join me. Thank you very much, Rob, for that, uh, those generous remarks, and good afternoon. I'm honored to be with you today on behalf of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I'd like to welcome our audience here in the auditorium, as well as those joining us on our live stream, uh, both in the United States and around the world. Our conversation will last for about an hour, and then we will open it up for questions. Our panelists will also sign copies of their book after the program, which will be on sale in the lobby. Before we begin, as questions arise during this afternoon's program, I encourage you to write them on the index cards provided to you when you enter the theater. These will be collected throughout the program so that we can pose them to our experts at the end. I also encourage our audience who is tuning into the program from locations outside the museum to pose their questions during the program using the hashtag USHMM or ask why. I'd like to introduce our panelists for this afternoon. Uh, Omar Boom is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of California in Los Angeles. 
Sarah Abravaya Stein is Professor of History, Maurice Amato Endowed Chair in Sephardic Studies, and Sadie and Ludwig Kahn, Director of the Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, also at the University of California, Los Angeles. I'd like to pick up where Rob began. Uh, for many of us, our understanding of North Africa's connection to the Holocaust uh, is drawn in part, at least, from uh, that 1942 film, Casablanca. But of course, it's much more complicated than that. Can you help us understand North Africa prior to Hitler's rise to power? OK, so uh, I think before I, we delve into this question, the first thing I would like to do is to uh, provide a general view of uh, this region, sociologically speaking, as well as politically speaking. So when you think about North Africa at the time, before the 1930s, you're basically talking about a population of 10 million in Morocco, this is including Jews, about eight to eight million in Algeria, uh, which around 200, uh, about around 2,800,000 in Tunisia, and I would say about 900,000 in Libya. So you have a very small population that came under diverse regimes, uh, political regimes. The first, when you look at Morocco and Tunisia, they, they were protectorate. And uh, as protectorate, they came under the uh, French colonial uh, administration, where in Morocco you have, uh, even under the French, you have the Sultan Sidi Mohammed ben Youssef. And in, Alge in Tunisia, you have the Bey uh, Monsef. In, Algeria, you have a different story, where by 1848, Algeria was already under, uh, was, a, was a, a French, part of the French uh, 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 empire. Uh, it came, it was uh, literally um, uh, not only part of the, the legal, but also part of the administration in three departments. We have the Department of Algiers, Department of Oran, and the Department of Constantine. And through that, the Algerian Jews by 1870, uh, they were already French Jews, which is not the case in Morocco and Tunisia. Libya was, and, uh, in, uh, Libya was under the Italian, Italian administration. So, so here, w economically speaking, the, the country was already shifting or moving from a traditional economic system to a very modern system as the French government and as the Italian government were introducing new economic programs in the region. So that's, that's what I would say as far as the, the general context. Sarah, Omar just touched on the Jewish population. Can you say a little bit more about the Jewish population in the region? Sure. Well, I would say when we are speaking about North African Jewry before the war, the, the most important stepping off point is to say that this is a highly diverse population variegated by place, variegated by class, from urban to rural. So it is no less um, diverse and culturally lively than, for example, we would expect of the European continent. Um, the Jewish population lives before the war, as, as Omar hinted, under different legal regimes. There are Jews who are uh, French citizens, according to a late 19th century French colonial law. There are Jews who are subjects of the protectorates of um, Tunisia or Morocco. Um, additionally, we have intra-Jewish diversity in this region. There was an autochthonous Arabophone and Berbophone Jewish population dating to medieval times, but there was also a Spanish Jewish population whose roots dated to the 15th century. And these communities overlapped and mingled and also maintained distinction. And in addition, there were also Jews who were often native to the region who might hold the citizenship of a, a European country. So, legally and culturally, linguistically, and also religiously. This is a diverse cultural landscape with some Jews living in, in rural, primarily um, Berber communities in rural settings who live side by side with their Muslim neighbors, Jews living in distinct Jewish um, residential zones in parts of North Africa, but also we have a, a somewhat acculturated, often into a French cultural bourgeois landscape 
Jewish population across the cities of North Africa. So this is a diverse cultural world undergoing the same sorts of modern transitions that the Muslim popular Arab and Berber population of North Africa is undergoing in the 20th century. Um, a move towards new neighborhoods of cities, a move to embrace uh, new technologies, whether it's the radio or the um, wonderful photographs of the embrace of um, cinema, you know, of, of um, Vespa, some of my favorite photographs of personal archives are people enjoying just simply the pleasures of life that marked this region and an ascent to the middle class by many, but not all, of the Jews in this region. And so Jews and Muslims are live intertwined lives. The extent of that intertwining depends on all sorts of factors, but they live intertwined lives across this region while also being wrapped up in a cultural landscape that has been for many years profoundly impacted by European colonialism and also by um, aspirational bourgeois norms that inclined people towards new forms of culture, new languages, new forms of entertainment, and so on. And along with that diversity of, of the Jewish community, of course, we also have an influx of uh, Jewish European refugees coming through the region. Can you speak a little bit to that particular aspect of it? Yeah, this is very important, and of course, this comes to be pivotal um, in the course of the unfolding of the Second World War, that as the war begins in Europe, we start to see large numbers of Jewish and non-Jewish refugees um, arriving across North Africa arriving for different reasons. Some are Jewish families fleeing the rise of fascism or Nazism. Uh, some are volunteer fighters for the Spanish Republican Army who are caught up in the war, perhaps retreat to North Africa, um, especially as they risk falling under Vichy rule. Um, and so we have an, a growing and, an, and um, increasingly desperate refugee population that is also heterogeneous. Jewish, Christian, victims of political violence, people who have volunteered to fight for a political cause, but people who are displaced, who are looking for exit visas, looking for philanthropy, looking for, in many cases, um, the opportunity to reunite with families who have um, dispersed across the region and, and beyond. Uh, Sarah touched on this just a minute ago. I'm wondering if we can go a little bit more into this interaction between local Jews and local Muslims, because we so often think of those populations as distinct. And one of the really interesting things about this region is that intertwining of stories and experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think when we talk about the this relationship between Jews and Muslims across not only years and centuries, but I would say this is a long-standing tradition of not only in urban, but also in uh, rural areas, where Jews, as one of the oldest settlement, Jewish settlements in the world, happen to be in this region. Uh, so, and I think over time, that created this bond and this partnership and this collaboration between Jews and Muslims that with the coming of new generations after the Inquisition, it's been re even reinforced and it enriched this uh, history of Jewish-Muslim relations mostly in urban areas, and at some point this became actually, this came in conflict at some point with the local, uh, with local Jewish traditions, and it also enriched Moroccan, Algerian, Tunisian cultures, not only in terms of food, in terms of music, in terms of also of culture, which you see today. Uh, so all of these elements that over time really created a sense of a Jewish, not only Jewish history, but also a Jewish, North African Jewish culture which he still lives today, not only in these communities where we have a smallest number of these communities today, but even in, uh, outside these communities. So, so, that, so definitely, with, as Sarah mentioned, with this coming of these European Jewish communities, not only during the war, but even prior to the war, you already have a strong Jewish culture that's been embedded in community, rural communities as well as as urban communities. You cannot, for instance, in certain areas in the south of Morocco and south of Algeria, talk about a farming economy without the role of Jews. But also you cannot 
talk about a Jewish settlement and a Jewish presence without the role of Muslims. And that also, you can see it in legal systems where Jews can actually shop around uh, to go and, and figure out a way how to deal with, like, with, with, with legal cases by going to Muslim courts instead of going to Jewish court and vice versa. And so you have that really rich uh, tradition that I don't, I don't think you see it, it, you see it, it's as diverse I would say as that what happened in, in, in some, European, in some Europe, European countries prior to the Holocaust. So given this really rich intertwining, uh, when the war arrives, or at the very least when um, anti-Jewish laws and kind of officially entrenched uh, racism in different ways arrives, how does the rise of anti-Semitism, racism, and ideology really, what does that look like in North Africa? How does that manifest itself? Yeah, yeah I, I think to, to think about anti-Semitism in North Africa, you have to, to go back to the different French departments in uh, Algerian departments. You have to look at Constantine, you have to look at Algiers, you have to look at Oran. This is where the beginning, and I would say the first roots of this anti-Semitic tradition was basically uh, began to, 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 to rise. And it rose basically as not only as a, re mostly as a reaction to the Crimea decree. Uh, by 1870, the, a lot of European French as non-French settlers in Algeria did not uh, appreciate the fact that Jews had became citizens. So you have to look at the influence of people, uh, people like uh, uh, Dramont and people like um, Renan and, uh, and other, uh, and, uh, and other uh, uh, French anti-Semites who've written about things that are anti-Jewish and then the newspapers by 1880s allowed the, basically the expansion of this anti-Jewish discourse in, in different Algerian regions. And then by, you have the, uh, the Dreyfus affair really made it a, a very, um, I would say, important issue that by the, the turn of the, 20th, of the 20th century, you have a culture of anti-Semitism that became part of the administration, the French administration in Algeria. And to that extent, you start seeing a, a, a conflict between local Algerian Jews and local uh, European Christian, uh, not only French, but also other, other Europeans. What we call the neos, these are people who came to Algeria and got citizenship after, after, the, after, after the Jewish community. So, that, so I think that's the context. And from there, it, become, it would find its ways into some French circles and European circles in Tunisia as well as in Morocco and Libya with the rise of the, of the, of the, of the uh, right-wing leagues, in mostly in, French, in France, in the metropole, as well as in, as well as in the colonies. So the, the French Jews, in, in, uh, and mostly in France, in Paris, became aware of this. By, 18, by 1927, the, what we call the International League Against Anti-Semitism and Racism, head by, headed by Bernard Lecache, became really aware of this problem, that they thought that with the expansion of anti-Semitism and the rise of these uh, anti-Jewish groups in Italy, in Germany, in Spain and in Portugal, and as well as in France, they were, they were conscious of this, and then they become to be interested in, ex in creating a relationship between Jews and Muslims, and enforcing that by bringing in uh, people like the uh, Ben Gabrit, even having conversations with people, circles in the protectorate, in, in, the, in, the, in the Moroccan administration, not the French, but also uh, talking to Moroccan scholars, uh, religious scholars, talking to Algerian scholars, and then you start seeing this debate about how Muslims and Jews are, are actually targets of this potential enemy, which is the anti-Semitic and, and the Nazi discourse, which starts really to become a problem by the mid-1930s. Well, I could perhaps take the story to the next chronological phase, which is to say that when the Second World War breaks out, what we find unfolding is that the Jews in this region will be subjected to the violence and racial legislation of, of not one but three Second World War regimes. The Nazi Third Reich, which will for six months directly occupy Tunisia, the fascist leadership of Italy in Libya, and the French Vichy regime. 
and Tunisia, I should say, was occupied the boundaries continue to shift, occupied by Vichy at times, by the Nazis at times, during warfare territory, changing hands between um, the Allies and the Axis powers. And under these three regimes, the fascist Italian, Vichy French, and um, Nazi German regimes, North African Jews and some North African Muslims, too, will be targets of race laws, of imprisonment, of forced labor, of spoliation. Most will not be sent to the de death camps of Europe. We can talk about exceptions, if you like, in, in time. But um, there, are, there are exceptions, especially in Libya, where, um, from which the Italians will deport um, Jewish holders of British papers. However, um, despite the fact that they will not be deported en masse, we do find that there are thousands of Jews in North Africa, some Muslims in North Africa, and Christians who perhaps were volunteers for the Spanish Republican Army, perhaps worked for the, worked for the French Foreign Legion, who will be imprisoned in labor camps um, across North Africa and various forms of internment camps um, where they will be subject to forced labor, for example, on the site of a fantastical Trans-Saharan railway project that the Vichy regime had first, um, and of course Robert Sotloff talks about this in his book, uh, the French had harbored a fantasy of building this railway since the 19th century uh, to connect the Sahara to ports of exit on the Atlantic or the Mediterranean coasts. And across these camps we find, as I say, Muslims, Jews, and Christians all being swept up into a machine of uh, imprisonment and forced labor. And many of the Jews who are imprisoned in these camps will be arrested as foreigners. And this perhaps brings us back to the motif of Casablanca. They are arrested as foreigners and, uh, and deported under the rules, especially of the Vichy regime. So let's say a little bit more about that, because we think of the camp system, we don't think of the Sahara Desert, for one thing. We don't think of that type of labor. We also don't think of kind of the multitude of nationalities that we're, we're really looking at here. Um, we saw some images that were directly related to those camps in, in the desert, but there were other types of camps as well, if we can expand on that a little bit. I, I think when, you th when we think about camps, we think about, I would say, three categories of camps. You have uh, penal camps, detention camps, and, and uh, forced labor's camps. And some, so you got in different types of camps, as these, as these refugees are uh, basically fleeing Europe, they're basically faced with the sea. And then through the sea you have, you got two options. You can go to Lisbon, and from Lisbon you will find your way either to the, Amer to the New World, to the United States, or to Latin America. A lot of, a lot of uh, refugees could not make it to the United States because of some uh, restrictions at the time, as we can talk about that in Q&A. But, uh, and those who, can, who could not make it through that, through uh, Portugal, they would go through Casablanca. And that's why you have the, the that's what uh, uh, Rob talked about in his introduction. So this trickling, which at some point became more of a flood, I would say, so it became with few people in the early periods of the rise of the Nazis, and then at some point it became a flood with the, with the uh, after the French, uh, after France signed the, basically the, the agree, agreed to, uh, for the, for the, to, to be part, to have the northern part of France under the, under the Nazi rule. So this, as this flood would later on, you start seeing a triage of different groups. So uh, that triage would either would begin with certain parts in sending a lot of these refugees to different camps, and then from there, later on by 1942, you really start having a sending these different groups, sometimes between 200, 200 to 250 uh, uh, refugees, mostly men, to these labor camps that are not only tied to, as Sarah mentioned, in, uh, to these railroad systems that connect the Mediterranean to Sub-Saharan Africa and with the idea of connecting it to West Africa, but sometimes also they connect it to mines. And this is where actually you start seeing, by 42, you start seeing this pressure by the German government, the Nazi government, on the Vichy government to have, to make these, 
these, these mines like the uh, coal and zinc and all these mines that are part of the machine, the war machine that Germany was trying to establish. There's a lot of, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on this question, and I think uh, uh, Susan Miller probably is working on, on, on some of these points, but definitely I think this was part of the grand project that the Germans had as they, as they started to put pressure on, 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 the, Vichy, on the Vichy government, on the Pétain. On Pétain. So we've been talking about camps in North Africa proper. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about any Jews, Muslims, or Christians living in North Africa who were sent to concentration camps in Europe? Sarah, you alluded to that just a minute ago. Right. So um, there, there were never mass deportations from North Africa to the camps in Europe. But North African Jews end up in camps in Europe through a variety of um, means and mechanisms. Uh, on the one hand, well, there are going to be multiple hands here, but on the one hand, there will be um, Libyan Jews who hold British passports, who are um, deported, find themselves first being sent to Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen, um, and some will return home after the war. We also have Jews who are North African who find themselves in France during the war. And some of these Jews will be deported. They may or may not have French citizenship. An example of this category would be someone that people may be familiar with, Victor Perez, who was a Tunisian Jewish boxer and world flyweight champion in 1931 and 1932, and along with many other North African Jews, finds himself in France um, in the, the moment of deportation and will be sent um, to, he's arrested in Paris, he is sent to the uh, transit camp at Drancy, uh, deported to Auschwitz, where he is forced to box for the amusement of the SS overseers. Um, he will survive internment, uh, only to die in a death march um, at the tail end of the war. I would say that we still need to do our work to learn, although Victor Perez's story has been the subject of a, of a recent film, we still have to do our work to learn more about the North African Jews who find themselves mostly in France and are deported through those circumstances. Um, Additionally, there are complexities in Tunisia. Um, the Italians in Tunisia had opposed, uh, well, when, when the uh, Italian authorities opposed the deportation of Jews um, who hold Italian citizenship from Tunisia. But in 1942, um, once deportations begin from Libya, there are additionally um, Jews from Italy, uh, from, excuse me, from Tunisia, who get swept up in these deportation orders as well. Uh, as we continue our conversation, I would like to remind you to submit questions on the index cards provided to you, and volunteers will be walking through the aisles to collect your questions during the rest of the program so that we can pose them to our experts at the end. Uh, to transition a, a little bit, uh, Rob started us out on this point of thinking about uh, resistance and rescue, uh, and I wanted to pose that question to the two of you in terms of thinking about how those two concepts that we're so familiar with in terms of Holocaust history operated in this region. I think I would, I would start by stating that we cannot, when we think about, and this is something that I would argue that a lot of research has to be done uh, on, and because when we think about the question of resistance, I don't think it's only individual. I think there is a communal form of resistance too. And I think, the, the, let's say, for instance, when we talk about the, the implementation of the anti-Jewish laws, especially in Algeria, where you start as, because when you think about Algerian Jews and with the French colonial uh, presence there from going back to 1830 to, uh, to the period of the war, what you see is that Algerian Jews were assimilated. They were part of the French of the Algerian French Algerian society, and then as you start implementing these laws, what you have you have basically the marginalization, the beginning of the marginalization of these of these Algerian Jewish communities and losing their jobs as as uh, as as productive citizens of the, of of the community at the time. So I would argue that part of this resistance on the part of the Algerian Jews, some of some Algerian Jews went to Morocco. But a lot of Algerian Jews really were able to organize among themselves and 
create their own educational system because a lot of them were expelled from schooling. So that's, that I would say that's, that's in itself a form of resistance. You have also part of the form of resistance too, you have uh, the case of uh, Alge other uh, Jews who were part of supporting not only Muslims, but also Jews who were interned in the camps. So, and then we have the case of Ellen Ben Attar that we can come back to later, which, which played, who played a major role, I would say, in supporting a lot of these European Jews by sending them food, clothes, shoes, and so on and so forth. So these are just very sh uh, small cases that I would argue the part of this resist resistance. You want to say a little bit more about Ellen Benatar? It's an interesting uh, case of a North African Jew helping other refugees, yeah. which is what so, I think so, makes so, it unique. So, so when you look at Ellen Benatar, she has a very interesting relationship with, with Nogues, with the, with, the, with the French uh, colonial administration. She, she used her contact with Nogues and, and, and part of the, and, and the Algerian government Sorry, and the French government in Morocco to uh, support these refugees. But at the same time, she was also denied a job, her job as a lawyer, because after the implementation of the anti-Jewish anti laws, which, I, which is, I think it's very interesting because, but still, she, was, she still made sure that uh, she would continue to find ways, different ways to support these, these uh, refugees to the extent that after the American landing, the Allies landing, she would visit these, these internment camps. She would uh, make sure that connects them to their families. Of course, she did not help with uh, people who were politically, who were interned there for political reasons, but people who were interned there for, uh, who, who did not commit any, from the French uh, perspective, were not undesirables, politically undesirables. She, would able, she was very able to help them either uh, uh, leave the camps or and later on allow supported them into going either to the new world or uh, connect them with, with their families well I would expand on this question of resistance in, in a way by taking a step backward and say that I think as research on the story of the Holocaust in North Africa continues to develop we need to develop a richer vocabulary for resistance that suits this different landscape I think resistance, will, will ha we will have to allow it to mean different things in this setting where the shape of war was different and the shape of racial laws and, um, uh, and um, internment and forced labor was also different. And of course, the human lay of the land is, is different as well. So I think that we are still working towards a vocabulary unique to the North African setting that adequately describes the, the variety of forms that resistance took. One of the things that Omar and I are continuing to investigate now is the subtler forms of um, resistance and a struggle to retain a sense of humanity in the forced labor camps and the way in which the pursuit of um, objects like shoes, um, the making of art, the attempt to create gardens, we find you know, the way in which these phenomena manifest as, as means of re retaining humanity and resisting a oppressive regime. These find echoes in Europe, of course. In some ways, they are versions of a familiar pattern. But I think that, that we need to create new categories, new ways to understand this story that emerges organically from the North African context rather than borrowing concepts from what we know to be true of Europe and, and pasting them there. I mean, one, one could also mention that there are Jews involved in some of the military campaigns, including Operation Torch, who work for the Allies. There are rabbinical authorities who refuse to hand over lists of communal property. Some of these, I would say, accord with somewhat more classical um, definitions of resistance. But I think there is also um, a rich cultural world of um, manifestations that we have yet to fully understand. Yeah, it, it's interesting some of the images that we were seeing earlier as you were discussing kind of Muslim-Jewish partnerships while that happens before the war. Also, I, wouldn't, I don't know if, if you would quite put it into that category, but certainly there's, there's a dynamic going on there in terms of um, responding to racism and anti-Semitism even prior to the 40s and as the war is kind of getting going. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a uh, that's one of the uh, I 
when I was here at the museum, I remember in 2007, so I would say 2013, one of the things that I noticed really is this, this plethora of this amount of documentation we have about this relationship between Jews and Muslims in Arabic as well as in French that really document these connections that took place between Algerian, Moroccan, and Tunisian Muslims and Jews, not to the extent in terms of numbers that you would see in some part of France, but at least it existed there. People were aware of this danger of fascism that's uh, creeping, that's coming from, from, from Europe to the, to, to, the, to the southern part of the Mediterranean. And, and, and that actually really pushed a lot of these communities to deal with these questions. And I think one of the interesting things that you notice is that Muslim scholars from the Algerian uh, Association of Muslim Ulama to Tunisian and uh, Muslim students and sometimes uh, scholars, not only in North Africa, but also in France, in Paris, were debating these questions. And, and I think that's one of the fascinating things that you see that uh, Lika was involved in, and at some point you see it even after the war. So the first thing, and the first thing that happened after the war is that the president of Lika, Bernard Lokaj, uh, uh, met, had a meeting with the Sultan Sidi Mohammed bin Yusuf, the king of, later on, the king of Morocco in 1956, where they, he met him, they met in Paris, and they talked about what can be done so that you fight, in order to fight, what, to, to have this collaboration between Jews and Muslims to fight this danger of racism, hatred, anti-Semitism, and what we see today, even Islamophobia in, in, in the world. So, so I think, think that's, that's one of the things that that was really interesting in the 30s, and it will become part of what happened post-war. Right, so that's something that starts starts fairly early on and then continues yes. through the war, and as, as we see, uh, even continues after and has this afterlife. Yeah, and, and, Lika, and the Lika was really aware of that, was part of that. Bernard, I think Bernard Lukash, we really need to do more work on the, anti uh, the, international, the, the Lika. The, I think more work needs to be done in order to really highlight these partnerships, which were sometimes flawed because it, at, the, at some time it became about economics because a lot of the indigenous, the indigenous uh, Algerian and Moroccan and Tunisian Muslims didn't have the same opportunities that Jews had at the time. So people were aware of the economic disadvantages that, that and the Lika was trying to figure out a way how to support indigenous Muslims to find jobs, especially given the given the fact that we're talking about the 1930s, we're talking about and, uh, the, the economic, the challenges that both communities were going through, Muslims and Jews, so the Lika was trying to do that. And uh, you have the anti-Semites were trying to blame the struggles that Muslims were going through uh, by blaming them, blame them on, on, on Jews, just to make, sh make sure that you have this antagonism between the Jewish communities and the Muslim communities in the region. Um, so as we, we think about kind of the larger impact of uh, this type of work, uh, it's been 70 years since the Holocaust ended, but why and how and when did interest in research on, on this topic really begin? Um, on the one hand, we heard from Rob that on some level this has been known for some time, and yet we are all sitting here with uh, a sense that, that this is something new. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if both of you can speak to um, why now and why this? Sure. Um, well, in the book, in several of the essays in the book, in our introduction, in a contribution by Daniel Schroeder, in a contribution by Susan Gelson Miller, we are collectively meditating on the history of um, ignoring this history and also the history of writing this history and reviewing the roots of the scholarship which has led to our contribution and others um, being shaped today. Um, I don't want to rehearse these historiographic um, narratives because I think that would, um, that would enliven a, a history conference, but perhaps dull those here in our audience today. But um, what I would say is there, are, there has been a tradition of writing on this topic, but up until very recently, it has, as Rob said, been a marginalized history. And I think perhaps it's worth meditating for a moment on why it, it has been marginalized. Um, 
And the reasons are quite complex and diverse, and there are multiple reasons depending especially on, on um, what national context of memorialization and memory writing and academic writing you were referring to. But I would say that in Europe and the United States, so much scholarship has framed the history of the Holocaust as a continental affair. And then within the Israeli context, where, of course, so hundreds of thousands of European Jewish survivors settled, there we have seen how um, all Israeli youths, including North African Jewish youths, are caught up in a Holocaust memorialization that privileges a European story. And it has only been until recently that, that these trends, which are national, they are academic, they have to do with um, the shaping of familial memories and communal memories, it's only recently that there has been an attempt to sort of upset these trends. Um, of course, this museum has been very active in attempting to collect materials, Yad Vashem II in interviewing survivors, uh, the Shoah Foundation at the University of Southern California also in integrating into its story um, a North African and a, indeed a French West African perspective. Um, so I think that we are at a very important moment where it is perhaps not too late because there are survivors of, of diverse backgrounds who can help us tell this story. There is also a, a quite astonishing rash of publications, of memoirs, of diaries, um, of letters, um, sometimes fictionalized versions of family histories that are being published mostly in French, um, but also in Arabic, um, and perhaps to a lesser extent in English, that we can draw on to overturn an, an a lacuna that, uh, as Rob and Omar have mentioned earlier, it, it, this wasn't always assumed to be a black historical whole. It became so over time, and I think we are, it perhaps would have been better uh, several decades ago when more survivors were there to tell their, their stories, but we still have an opportunity to reverse this um, oversight and fill in this very important history. Yeah, I think I'm gonna put my Moroccan and American hat here at the same time. So, so, so for me as a as a as a Moroccan scholar, I, I think it's it's really Jewish studies in Morocco. It's a it's a very interesting stage right now, where you don't only have to there is a revival or at least an interest in more interest in the study of the Jewish communities of Morocco, but also at the same time there is an interest in the study of this chapter of World War II. Now, it's coming from a, a national perspective where try, people are trying to figure out what role Sultan, the Sultan Sidi Mohammed bin Yusuf played in this, in, this, in, this, in this period. But at the same time, there is also an interest on the part of scholars to figure out exactly how this, uh, how to not only to teach about this period, given the interest also coming from the top in, in the Moroccan state, uh, as far as this as this story itself, but also how th there is an interest also in among scholars to really engage this topic, which has always been marginal. So there is, uh, I think, there is of course with an interest that's been, I would say, I would credit a lot here the work that Rob has done in post in 2006 and what what the museum did in 2007, the first workshop that was done by the museum in 2009, but also there is really a a, a push from the top, from certain circles in North Africa, including mostly, I would say, in Morocco and Tunisia, where people are really interested in this topic for the sake of figuring out exactly how we can teach World War II to, younger, to a new generation of students, as well within high school, as, as well as within universities, to think about the issues that are connected to, I would say, racism to, the, to, to, to human beings and how we basically marginalize human beings, how we include the human beings in national project. So, so I think for me that's interesting and as we think about this as scholars, writing books, academic books, we're also trying to think about this as educators. And, and the, the mission of museums as well as the mission of universities to educate this new generation is for us 
part of this part of this project. So, uh, Omar, you did a great segue to kind of thinking about um, our, our final question and wrapping this part of our conversation up is. Uh, thinking about the impact of this research uh, and why it's what the study of North Africa brings to the Holocaust as much as what the study of the Holocaust brings to this region, right? And kind of thinking about how both of these subjects enrich each other and what uh, new things we know and how we know them um, in relation to thinking about a history that was previously, we can call it forgotten, we can call it a footnote, but didn't have the, the kind of attention that it's, it's starting to get today. Well, I would, I would begin to reflect on that question by noting that really ever since historical writing about the Holocaust began, which was just really, you know, as the, as the conflict is still unfolding, we see historical writing, of course, beginning. But ever since then, the conceptual and the geographic boundaries of Holocaust history have been expanding. And in that sense, this project is a continuation of what scholars of the Holocaust have been engaged in for decades, which is continuing to be relentless and inventive in looking for overlooked stories, whether they are the stories of women, whether they are the stories of, for example, the Sephardic communities of Southeastern Europe who received less attention than uh, Ashkenazi communities until recently, or whether it is North Africa, in fact, we're taking part, I would say, in a decades-long project to um, expand our coverage, expand our understanding, and to continue to rethink and, and, and uh, be elastic in crafting categories that help us understand the, these devastating human dramas. So in that sense, in answer to the question of um, what it achieves, I would say that it, that it continues to make this field fascinating and lively and unexpected and comprehensive in a way that has really been the mission of Holocaust scholars and students and educators um, for decades. I think at the same time, it can't be denied that we, I would say this project is also about thinking in a deeper way about who should be considered um, to have been a target of these regimes and um, whose story is worthy of attention and, and which stories in the plural are worthy of inclusion um, in not only history writing but in memory making and memorialization. Uh, so we'd now like to open up the afternoon to some questions that we've been collecting throughout the program. Uh, and Sarah, that uh, last comment actually perfectly transitions to the first one, which is um, how has the history of the Holocaust, how has the history of the Holocaust and this history specifically been memorialized in the region in North Africa itself? Uh, I think I would, I would say that uh, if you look at the, if you go back to the 1980s, there is a lot of there was a lot of conversations going on, mostly in certain circles, Moroccan Jewish circles, uh, in areas like Ashdod and Ashkelon, where they were, and most of these discourses about memory was tied to the connection between Moroccan Jews and the Sultan. So that's what in Algeria, in Tunisia you have a different story where you have the memorialization was mostly linked to the role of the, the, the Nazi role in, in, in instituting camps and racial laws in Tunisia. And then, and I think based on this, uh, that's why you have the, the project that uh, Rob has done in 2006, where trying to figure out exactly how people remember this. So part, where, where does this, period fit in the memory of Muslims as far as, this, as far as this period is concerned. So that really leads me to the question about what are the conversations of memory and remembering that are taking place in North Africa today. And I, I would argue that most of these conversations are really driven in two regions, in two countries. They're, they're mostly, I would say, Tunisia and Morocco in particular. And then the museum has done a lot of uh, work in both countries. I think 
the fact that uh, the 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 speech that the uh, King Mohammed VI gave in 2009 to the Aladdin uh, project in Paris, I think really has encouraged a lot of people to think about some of these issues. So I, that's what I call the top-down uh, project. And, and you can see a lot of people within uh, universities, like the Mimuna Club, for instance, that in 2011 they have, they've done their own conference on related to the Moroccan side of the story. So that's at least on the popular level. Now, on the academic level, I, there is still a lot to be done. I think there is still a focus mostly that the research is really being done on Moroccan Jewish communities instead of this period of, of the war because people are still trying to understand these communities, these Jewish communities and their relationship with, with, uh, to the Muslim communities. So, so, so you have, a, a, what, I, what, I would, what I would say is that the memorialization is really happening, being driven by the top and because the, you need to have a ground, I think a context for it, you need to have a, a what I would call the intellectual blessing that, that comes from this conversation that, that would later on lead to uh, the, 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 the research and the, how people think about this. There is a resistance, as in a lot of places, there is a resistance to where this, this debate fits in the national uh, project, but I don't think it's as uh, worrisome as, because there is, as Rob said, this, it's been shaken. There is a sh it's, the ground is shaken. And I think it helps us as scholars to think about this, to, to, be, to basically push the conversation uh, harder, is that what can we do as scholars to really lay out the ground, at least th think about the concept and how we can study these, the, the, these, these issues. I think hopefully in the future, we will probably have in the future people talking about these camps, having actually memorial sites in these camps, in Budnib, in places like Budnib, like places like Bu'arfa, uh, places like uh, uh, Jinin Burizg, all these camps. So we have plagues that probably uh, as, a, as a young, uh, as, a, as a citizen of Algeria or Morocco or Tunisia or Libya, when you go to these sites, you, you engage with these, with these sites and you try to think about these sites as sites of memory. But, but, but we have a long, long, long work need to be done there. So on the, the subject of recognition, uh, there's a question that asks about um, uh, Arabs or Muslims being recognized or not, as the case may be, as, as righteous Gentiles um, by Yad Vashem. And I would also expand that to um, victims of those camps recent, only really recently being addressed by the claims conference in some way. So I'm wondering if you can reflect on kind of that larger institutional recognition that seems to still be evolving. Question. Uh, the the question uh, that was posed was about um, Arabs or Muslims being uh, officially recognized by Yad Vashem as righteous among nations, mm -hmm. um, or I would expand that to say being recognized a little bit more broadly. Um, and um, I was also posing the uh, potential question of um, victims be from this region being recognized by, by the claims conference. So more broadly speaking, recog official recognition. Yeah, I, I think the I, I would. I would go back to something that Sarah mentioned about the new uh, language. What kind of language we're using in, as far as the, how we think about the victims and how we recognize and we remember uh, the people who play the role either in saving Jews or at least making sure that a lot of Jews and Muslims did not suffer during this period of time. So, and for me, I, I understand there is a logic as far as certain museums like Yad Vashem about what kind of language is used and that I think probably that's, I think, I, I don't think I'm stating something that's not secret here, that's what Rob has been <laughs> dealing with as far as the uh, Yad Vashem. And so I think there is a, a debate of, about how to approach this and how to define who is a victim and who has been a, uh, somebody who, who protect, how, how do you define somebody who protected a, a Jewish family or, or a Jewish internee in this? And, and there is a debate going on within the Moroccan Jewish community in relation to, for instance, their, the, the, the monarchy and the role of the sin. There is also a debate going on in, in the Tunisian community in relation to uh, people who saved Jews. There is also a debate going on in relation to uh, Ben Ghabarit and the Mosque of Paris. So I, and that, I think that's where the struggle is, is, is taking place. Now, 
the, the, the fact that Yad Vashem and other museums have recognized some uh, righteous among the nations in, in, the, in the museum, I think it's, it, it really testifies, the, it's a testimony to the fact that there was a lot of people who were concerned about the implementation of these racial laws and how it's really, and what they did in terms of the destruction of, of families. So I think that's, that's, I think, a positive thing to see. And then it, it helps us to broaden the, 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 how we think about this question itself and that the righteous, how we define right, and who is righteous. Uh, so this next question, I, I think, probably goes to Sarah as we're thinking about these multiple different types of stories. Uh, this person asks, can you tell us about a specific European refugee story that passed through North Africa? We kind of talked about it in the broad strokes, but if there's one you can... Um, we do have an image, I think, um, of a family um, from Poland who... Um, uh, the Kirk family... Uh, from Radom, Poland, who um, strategically dispersed in the course of the war. And there has been a, a family history written, a, a fictionalized version of the family history, describing how different members of the family um, sought refuge in different locations and, and journeyed in, in, through complex and diverse itineraries. The map gives you a sense of the reach that the family um, had to incline towards to, to seek rescue and to seek shelter. One member of the family travels um, from Poland through North Africa by, by way of French West Africa before, um, and, and also I think Dakar, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, before coming to Casablanca and Tangier, before coming to Casablanca to seek the papers that would eventually allow for emigration abroad. So. This map that we see here really, I think, offers you a sense of how the landscape of North Africa for some families is a piece of a global puzzle of migration. Not every family was this um, peripatetic in the course of the war, traveled this far or to this many multiple places, or necessarily divided among themselves to seek different refugee destinations. But so many refugees found their way to Morocco especially, but across North Africa, but especially to, to Casablanca, um, after first traveling complex migratory routes and could stay for a period of months or a period of years. And I know that the museum also holds the papers of the Freud, the family of Sophie Freud, who uh, was another um, uh, a woman who came with her um, with is it her her mother I believe S D Freud and sought um, temporary refuge in Morocco for a period of months and we see through photographs of the Freud family and also oral histories of these families the letters they sent um, the diaries um, we can trace a, a story of the Holocaust that engages dynamically with Europe, of course, and with the events of the war, but shows North Africa to be this crucial terrain of familial history, Jewish and non-Jewish, of course, um, that is uh, entirely wrapped up in, in, actually, in some ways, we can compare it just from the refugee perspective to Shanghai, how this becomes such an important or Lisbon, such an important place for multiple stories to converge. And these stories will last um, an unpredictable amount of time. Of course, what is different about North Africa from Shanghai or Lisbon is that these refugees were vulnerable to arrest in this space of refuge, vulnerable to arrest as foreigners um, and as suspect enemy aliens not only arrest, of course, but deportation to camps. So it is a complex place of refuge, and in that sense, of course, is entirely different from the other sites I mentioned. Yeah, and I, I think it reminds us quite what a global history we're dealing with, right? Uh, as the two of you have, have spoken about throughout this afternoon, we so often think about this as a European story, and even more specifically, a Central or Eastern European story, uh, and a lot of what 
these stories, these refugee stories in particular, but really all of what we've been talking about is not just expand the map, but remind us of the global reach of, of what was going on during this period in a lot of, I think, really important and Im impactful ways. Uh, we have another question about what the long-term impact of uh, Jewish-Muslim relations were based on the wartime period. So is, do we see, and Omar, you started to point to this with the, your remarks about Lika and uh, their activities that stretched, uh, in, in some cases, well into the 50s, uh, but what do we see as the result of um, the in, those interactions during that period, some alliances, some not? Uh, if you could speak a little bit more to that. Uh, I, I think... Uh most of these uh, alliances were really taking place in Algeria. I don't think, uh, and as I, as I said, given the history of um, anti-Semitic uh, discourses and uh, anti-Semitic activities that were taking place, and sometimes acts of violence against Jews. Uh, so if you look at, for instance, between the 1920s and 1934 with the Constantin uh, event basically uh, targets against the Jewish communities of Constantin. Uh, th those you have over 60, over 60 uh, events just in Constantin, and, and and I think that really pushed, as I said, the Lika to really figure out a way how to bring together Muslims and Jews. So that's so I would say the 1930s were really uh, the uh, the moment where these relationship existed. Uh, and fortunately, by the, the, by the, the the time by, by June 19 by June 1940, with the with the basically the Hitler's taking over army taking over France, those those basically uh, activities cease to exist. So you have to wait till the period after the war. And after the war, nothing. I would say not a lot has been done after that. So, so I would say the between I would say 1936 and 1938 was a moment was a very was a golden moment as far as these alliances, especially as the Lika the Bernard Lokash came to Algeria and Tunisia and Morocco. You have a lot of chapters that were created, included Jews and Muslims. Not a lot of Muslims, given the fact of the because a lot about class. So it has more Jews than Muslims. And 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 as I and as I said, by 1939, 1940 those plummeted, those activities plummeted because you have the one month after, almost one month after the Petan takes over, you have the implementation of the, the first anti-Jewish laws, and then 1941, you have the implementation of the second uh, uh, anti-Jewish laws, and that, that basically would eradicate all those alliances. Uh, we have another question that speaks specifically to uh, the Libyan context. We talked about it just a little bit in terms of those refugees, but um, Sarah, maybe this goes to you, if you can say a little bit, a bit more about uh, Libyan Jews during the period uh, and how this persecution played out for them a little differently in some cases than in other parts of the region. Well, Libya is such a complex site because um, the, the battle lines are shifting constantly, especially in, in the south. Um, so it's very contingent on the moment in war in which you find yourself. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the Italians um, resist deporting the Jews from, from Libya, um, as well as um, any Italian Jewish holders of Italian citizenship living in Tunisia, uh, until... Um, the decision is made later in the war to deport British holders of, of Italian citizenship because they are perceived to either have allied with the Allies at, at a moment in which the Allies control the relevant territory, or they represent a threat of a population that will ally with a foreign power. And so there was an image showed earlier of some of the Jews in Libya who are deported, but to be clear, they are not deported because they are, uh, they are Libyan Jews, but because they are Libyan Jews who hold British papers. So um, this terrain is, is just immensely nuanced because of the shifting borders of war. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think, thank you. And uh, for our last question, I wonder if uh, one or both of you could say a little bit about um, Jews in the region today, um, or in some cases, the memory of Jews in the region today, um, and kind of where we are post-48, um, really post-68. And 
You mean, you mean in the present? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I'll go back to the numbers. I think the numbers speak for themselves. So uh, in the 30s, you have about 240 to 270,000 Jews in Morocco and about 150, 140 to 150,000 in Tunisia, 80,000 to 100 in, in uh, sorry, in Algeria, 80,000 to 100 in Tunisia, and I would say 40 to 50,000 in Libya. If you look at all these countries today, I would say less than 800 in Tunisia, and about between 3,000 to 4,000 in Morocco, and I would say no Jews in, in Algeria and Libya. And that's basically tells you a story and that's, but then when it comes to the memory, I think there is more, uh, the Moroccan and the Tunisian context are really interesting in many ways. I think in Morocco, the, the Jews still remain, even with their the small number, they still remain the, what I would call a model minority in the sense this is very important for the Moroccan state, it's for the Moroccan, for the Moroccan society to remember and uh, think about the Jewish community as part of their of, of the of the of the nation. Uh, it's being showcased even in the new constitution and all. Well, I would say the same thing in Tunisia too, despite the struggle. But you have you have difficulties still. I think that the communities are going through because with the numbers, there is more pressure sometimes on the on the community, especially in times of. Uh, of, of, of what goes on today in, in the world, so so I think so I think that that puts the, that puts sometimes the community a lot of pressure on the community. But at the same time, I think there is an internal dynamics in in terms of how the community also thinks about home. So you have a lot of return on the part of the Tunisian, largely in the part of the Tunisian and the Moroccan Jewish communities. I mean, given the fact that you have a diaspora all over the world and given the nature of Judaism in this part of the world, and the idea of Hilulot and uh, uh, the celebration of shrines, and that's part, that's a, an integral part of what it means to be a Moroccan Jew or a Tunisian Jew. So I, I see some hope in the future as far as this continuation of this memory, and the, I would say World War II is part of this debate too, in, in the minds of, this, of, the, of, the, of the Jewish communities. But it's, there is also a lot of pressure on them because not a, as the, the community is, gr is getting older and older, the numbers are, will continue to go, to, to go down. And as these communities also, the youth are leaving. So what, you, what the struggle that the states are facing is to how to make sure that this, this memory lives on. And that's why you have, there is a project of museums the museums in Tunisia, the museums in Morocco. Morocco, you already have a museum in Casablanca, but there is a project of building three more museums, one in Tangier, one in Marrakech, and one in Essaouira to represent all this diversity. There is a similar project, I think, going on in Tunisia. There is a discourse about even going on in the public radio and the media, where you have now a program in, in Moroccan Arabic about the people of the Mellah, the people of the Jewish neighborhood that has been going on in the last six months. So, so there is, I would say, there is an interesting thing happening at the level of museum, radio, uh, the media, but I would still, there is still the, a, a struggle to educate a new generation of youth about what it means to be Jewish in Morocco. And I think that's uh, people like the Mimuna Club, these are generations of youth, Moroccan youth are trying to figure out, and they're collaborating with Tunisian, uh, members of the Tunisian civil society. And now, which is very interesting, I think, which is, I think, really fascinating to see is how these generation of youth now are collaborating with Egyptian Jews, the, or the, the, few, the, the few six or five J Jewish, uh, Egyptian women that are basically left, and then, which I think it's a fascinating thing to see how now Moroccan Muslims, Tunisian Muslims, uh, and uh, Egyptians now are taking Judaism, are owning the Juda Juda Judaism of their own countries. So uh, thank you, Omar and Sarah, for sharing your insights about this topic with us today. I think it's been really fascinating for all of us. Uh, before Omar and Sarah sign copies of their new book, The Holocaust in North Africa, I invite uh, Dr. Lisa Leff, the director of the Mandel Center, to close out our program. 
Thank you, all three of you, for such a thought-provoking conversation. Um, it's difficult to believe that as recently as 10 years ago, when you talk about that first um, symposium, uh, North African Holocaust history was so little known. Now we know that the Holocaust has much greater impact than we did then. In Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, there was anti-Semitic legislation, forced labor, there was resistance, rescue. All of these, of course, took place within a context that was different than what we usually hear about in this space. When we hear this history, we have a better understanding of the region and a better understanding of the Holocaust. This museum has worked hard with our partners like Sarah, Omar, Rob, to bring the history of the Holocaust in North Africa to the attention of scholars and to the attention of the public. We support research scholars and educational programs, and we're also working on creating a large archive to support our work in this area, and you've seen some of the photos that come from those efforts. We've collected records from individuals and families, and we've also collected from institutions, including um, making digital copies of select records from the National Library of Morocco. We've also created resources on the topic, also in collaboration with leading scholars in the field. Omar and Sarah have themselves recently added several valuable articles to our online Holocaust encyclopedia. Their titles include Labor and Internment Camps in North Africa, as well as Jews of the Maghreb on the Eve of World War II, topics they talked about today. And that's just a few of their contributions. Also, Experiencing History, which is our digital primary source tool for the college classroom, includes sources that speak to the plight of North African Jews during the Holocaust. We hope this program has created new questions as well as a new awareness about the Holocaust shadow in this region. We encourage you to take a look at the museum's resources and to donate materials for future research in the area. Please note that Professor Stein and Professor Boom will be available to sign copies of their book up in the lobby. Thank you so much for joining us and have a nice afternoon.